make sure my mic is rolling. It is. Um, so I entitled this lesson, Love Greater Than the Pain of Betrayal, because um, the book of Hosea is a very difficult book to read. So hopefully you've read it by now. And, um, but we're going to talk through it um, this morning. There's, there's just a whole bunch to it that is very frustrating. It is, um, he is, Hosea is a very unique character because he is uh, called by God very early in his life to be a prophet, to, to be a mouthpiece for the Lord. He lives in a very um, disturbing period of time in the history of Israel. And God actually tells, instructs him who to marry and why. And that is unique among the prophets. Nobody was ever told to do that. And um, so we'll get into some of the history of it and then sort of the meaning. Why, why, do, why is God charging him with the task of marrying um, who he is asked to marry? This is a book about betrayal or the feelings of betrayal. And, um, and so I don't personally know this, but um, those who have experienced the betrayal from a spouse, um, it is among the worst things that people can experience um, when you commit yourself to one person for the rest of your life and then that person is not faithful. Um, it is life altering. And for a lot of people, it becomes a, such a point of depression um, that their lives are never, they never recover from it um, because they were fully committed to someone and then the other person did not reciprocate that. The reason that God instructs Hosea to be in the relationship that he's in is because he wants Hosea to experience what he's experienced. And that way he can be empathetic to what God has experienced for so many years. Hosea comes along at the time of, he's probably um, a prophet around the year 760 to around 710. He prophesies for 50 to 60 years. Um, at the beginning, we're going to read this, at the beginning he's called by God to go and marry a woman of prostitution. Um, and her name is Gomer, which is an unfortunate name, but um, it is her name. And he is to... Um, marry her, and we're not exactly told the purpose of it, but he's to choose someone from a prostituting family, basically, which was, in other words, the, um, the livelihood of certain families depended on prostitution. And obviously these street families were not um, God worshipers, but they lived among the Israelites. They were Israelites, and they lived among those people but they themselves did not, you know, because they lived such an obvious lie, they were not people who others respected or had any um, uh, care for. But the problem with Israel at the time of Hosea is this. Prostitution was such a common thing that it was almost impossible to differentiate the prostitution families, the, the people who had given themselves over this lifestyle, from the Israelites who were supposed to be law-abiding people. It was almost impossible to recognize one from the other. So at the time of Jeroboam II, if you go back a few pages, we're using the Daily Bible again. And if you go back a few pages from, we're going to start on page 758. So if you have a normal Bible, turn to the book of Hosea. If you have the Daily Bible, it's on page 758. Um, Hosea starts his prophecy at the time of Jeroboam the second. Remember we talked about, um, Jer so Jeroboam is the first king of Israel. Rehoboam is the first king. Rehoboam is Solomon's son, and Rehoboam is the first king of Judah. So you have basically, after David and Saul, David, and Solomon, 120 years of that, you have a divided kingdom. So you have the, the northern ten tribes, which would then become called the lost tribes of Israel. If you're not familiar with that term, that's the commonplace term um, among Jews to describe the 10 northern tribes because once they got into Assyria, their backgrounds were lost. Nobody knew which tribe they were from. And by the time they come back to Israel, that information is lost. Of course, in 70 AD, uh, 40 years after the time of Jesus, when Titus comes into Jerusalem and 
uh, knocks out the temple, all the records are lost for everyone. So people in the tribes of Judah, and Judah had absorbed Simeon, and part of Benjamin was among Judah, all those tribes were lost too. So, but the original title for the lost tribes of Israel pertained to the 10 northern tribes. That Israel falls in 722 BC, and they fall to the Assyrians. So if you're looking sort of correctly here, here's, um, here's Israel, and uh, over here is uh, the Mediterranean Sea. Um, then it's over here. I have to kind of do this backwards. But it's over here that Assyria is. And they come in and they conquer. They've been pestering Israel for years. And they come in and they conquer Israel in the year 722 and they take them captive. And from that point on, Israel would sort of cease to be. They would come back at the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. And they would rebuild parts of the temple and the wall and everything else. But the reality was it was, it was gone. And we're at 760 when Hosea begins to prophesy. And he prophesies to around the year 710. We don't know exactly when, but if you look at the beginning of Hosea's book, he begins in the time of Jeroboam II, and he goes through the time of, uh, into the time of Hezekiah. Hezekiah began ruling after, or at the time, that Israel fell. So most likely, he sees the fall, the captivity, captivity of the northern uh, country of Israel. And he sees the fall, and when Assyria conquers Israel, that he's not the only prophet who's going to speak of what will happen. But there are lots of things that were going to happen. And in fact, he is going to say that when that happens, the pregnant mothers are going to have their, their bellies torn open and their babies torn from their womb. And that's one descriptor of maybe 15 that are in the book of Hosea of what will happen when Assyria comes in and takes over Israel. And I'm just mentioning the one. Because I just want you to think about if that's one of the descriptors of maybe 10 things, nothing good is going to happen when Assyria comes in and takes Israel. And he, here Hosea stands before these people. And he doesn't know what the time frame is. But it's, it's 20, 30, 40 years from the time that he speaks to them that they fall. There were only a few of the prophets that were sent to the northern kingdoms. Hosea is one of them. And he stands before them, and before he's able to stand before them, the very first thing that God says to him is, go take for yourself a wife. And so he's to live with this wife. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. Almost from Jeremo, Jeroboam II, which was his reign began just before the time of Hosea. From Jeroboam II on, Jeroboam's son became king after Jeroboam II. And he reigned for less than a month and was assassinated. And then the guy after him who, who took over from him assassinated was assassinated. And he ruled for about a year. And so from the time, this is in the last 30 to 40 years of time in the northern kingdom of Israel, there are seven to eight kings who rule in a period of 20, 21 years, something like that. And almost all of them are assassinated by their successor. And that says something about the nation of Israel and what they had become and how far removed they were from God. And you think back, and Hosea is pointing that out. Hosea is actually a very smart guy. Um, a lot of the prophets, they just speak the words of God. Hosea is actually speaking poetry and talking about the covenant relationship that God has shared with Israel for all this time. And he goes back to Jacob and goes back to the time of Moses and Joshua. And he cites all of these examples of, you know, God provided for us. God did all these things for us. And, and yet you flaunted all of that. And now look where we stand. And he doesn't know the time frame. He never gives a time frame as to when Israel's going to fall. But he's 20 to 30 years from it. And Israel's going to fall and they're going to fall hard. And so here he, he gives these descriptors of what it's going to be like because you've ignored the word of God. 
And I'm going to point one more thing out before we get into the reading. At the same time that he's prophesying, it's almost like he's double-tongued. At the same time he's prophesying and saying, you're going to fall because you didn't do what God asked you to do. At the same time, in every point in this book, he then says, but if you'll repent, God will take you back. It's this really odd book because, well, he's teaching the condemnation and the punishment and the judgment of a group of people who are idolaters and adulterers and murderers. He's at the same time saying, but all you have to do is turn back to God and, and he'll take you back. And here's how it's illustrated. It's illustrated in Hosea. Hosea is to take to himself a wife like Israel, unfaithful. And Hosea has three kids through his wife. And he names them the oracles which he speaks. You know, I've talked about this before. We name our kids whatever sounds rhymy to us or interesting to us. We don't give it a second thought what the meaning of their name is. My parents named me Joel. All of my other siblings have non-biblical names. I mean, my name is a very, very biblical name. When I, when I go through, you know, uh, a drive through and I give my name, people who have never, they, they don't know how to spell my name. It's usually J-O-L-E, you know. Real close. Open the Bible. You know, that's it. But the thing is, it's a very biblical name. It's not as bad as Jehoshaphat, but it's very biblical. And my, my siblings' names are not biblical at all. My parents didn't give a second, they didn't name me Joel because they thought Jehovah is God. They were just naming it because they thought it was, they liked the name. That's how we do. Even if we use a biblical name, it's just something from scripture that we sort of randomly choose. We're not speaking into that person's life before they, you don't understand? What they did was they spoke into somebody's life. And so when somebody is named Hosea, which is the same as, does that sound like any other biblical name? Hosea, Hosea is actually his name. Joshua, Jesus. It's the same basic name. Not all the same sounds, but the same basic name. And so here comes this guy, Hosea, who is named aptly who is going to speak these oracles into his three children. And the oracles are not great. So he names his, let's, let's just begin in Hosea 1 and verse 1, sort of break this down. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Beeri, during the reigns of Uzziah, who is a, a Judah king, and so is Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the reign of Jeroboam, the second son of Joash, king of Israel. Now, not just during, but this is what he's saying is it came at that time. So it, he actually um, saw seven kings of Israel during his time as a prophet, and about four kings of Judah. 50 to 60 years. He's about 20 at the time that this oracle comes to him. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Dib Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Okay, so child number one is a son. The Lord said, God tells him what to name the children each time. So the Lord said to Hosea, call him Jezreel. Does that name sound familiar? It should. So we've recently read about Jezreel um, in Chronicles and Kings. Jezreel was the place where Jezebel dies. Remember Jehu, who would become the king of Israel, goes to Jezreel, where Ahab, and, uh, where Ahab and Jezebel have a palace, sort of a secondary uh, palace, and it's sort of up on a cliff top, and he goes there and has the people in the tower, the servants in the tower, he says, who's with me? 
and they look down and he says throw her down and Jezebel is thrown down so that's that happened at Jezreel um, another thing that happened at Jezreel was the slaughter of um, the uh, the priests and so there's a lot of bloodshed that happens at this place and so he's uh, recalling that and he says um, call him Jezreel because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel in that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of uh, Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel so the very first kid is named um, uh, for the idea of scattering by God. So there are two ways to interpret his name. Jezreel could mean um, sown by God, to sow by God, or to be scattered by God. It's the same idea. Um, the idea is that um, you scatter seed on the ground. You're taking something and you're putting it for um, all to see. It's, it's sort of it's being put out by the wind. Um, and so that's what he's saying is that the, the very first oracle that Hosea speaks is Israel is going to be scattered by God because of the bloodshed at Jezreel. Um, and so uh, the second one, Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. So we have a son and then a daughter. And the Lord said to Hosea, call her lo Hurama." which means not loved, for I will know, imagine naming your kid not loved. <laughs> that's, that's a serious statement, right? Um, I don't have any daughters, but I can't imagine I'm naming them that. Anyways, uh, he says, uh, call her Lohurama, which means not loved, for I will no longer show love to Israel, that I should not at all forgive them, yet I will show love to Judah. So, in this one, uh, he mentions Judah. This prophecy by Hosea is almost exclusively about Israel. So there's a, there's a connection that you're going to see later and why he mentions Judah. And I will save them, not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses or, and horsemen, but I, the Lord, their God, will save them. In other words, not in the usual means. So this is an important thing. He says, I'm not going to save them by weapons but I will save them. I, the Lord their God, will save them. All right, so then, so you have a boy and you have a girl, and then she has another son. And the Lord said, call him Lo-Ami, which means not my people, for you are not my people. And, and this is the killer statement, and I am not your God. That's never been said. You're at, the, you're at 40 years before Israel, the northern ten tribes, are going to totally be swept away by the Assyrians and lose their identity. They will, and he's going to go on and tell them what that, what, what's that going to mean that you are taken captive? And he says, you're not my people, and I am not your God. When he has just said that as their God, I will salvage them. So that's the middle child. By the time you get to the last child, he's not going to do it. So there's this, it's an interesting thing that he's, he, he has the name as children. God's going to scatter us. You know, God's going to bring bloodshed for bloodshed. Because blood was shed on Jezreel of, of the priests of Baal and of uh, Jezebel. Was that justified? Yes, God told Jehu to do that. But because that happened... In other words, because it had to happen. Because you're so idolatrous. Because you don't actually know me and you shed blood. We're going to shed more blood. And then he names his other two children as oracles. And speaks to the people of Israel about things that are yet to come. So turn over. Let's, we're, let, me, let me go ahead and keep reading here. Uh, we're at Hosea 1 verse 10. I'm going to read this until we get to this in chapter 2, this oracle that, or the things that Hosea begins to say. Um, yet, the, yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. 
The people of Judah and the people of Israel will come together. They will appoint one leader and will come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. Jezreel, the day of scattering, the day of bloodshed. Say of your brothers, my people, and of your sisters, my loved one. Okay, now, you get into chapter 2 here in verse 2. Listen to this. So, God has told him to take a wife, and they have three children. The narrative part of this never says what happens next. They have three children. That's it. And then you get into this collection of poetry. So most of Hosea is poetry. And Hosea didn't write the book. Hosea told stories to the people who came after him about what had happened. And it's thought that Hosea is actually written by a group of other prophets to tell the prophecies that Hosea gives to the people of Israel because they did come to pass. He speaks in front of the people and he speaks this poetry to them. Did, was it hard for them to understand? I'm just going to tell you, I think so. So people who spoke the southern dialect of Hebrew a lot of times didn't speak, didn't understand very easily the northern dialect. Do you find that to be true? I mean, do you have a problem with northerners in the way that they speak? I know that for a fact as a northerner that you do. So don't try to cover it up, all right? Because that's what southerners do. They try to act like something is not what it is. I know you don't like us. It's okay, all right? That's, it's just a problem of dialect. And this guy is from the northern area. And so he, you know, we, we sort of joke about it, but in the north, we sort of speak directly. And we're not offended by the things that, each other, I mean, it's fine. You can say whatever you want. You're just wrong. But in the South, we sort of, we get around that, right? We sort of, we don't speak directly to it. We tell parables, you know? When we want to instruct somebody, we try to find a polite way to do it. And a lot of times that doesn't help and it doesn't work. But neither does the Northern way work all the time either, right? So, I mean, we, there's a point to like, sometimes you have to be just direct and sometimes you actually shouldn't be. And so, in a way, both of those dialects are correct. At the same time, you have this northern and southern dialect in Hebrew. And a lot of the southern, the people of Judah, didn't always fully understand what was being said by those in the north. And I'm going to tell you that at the time of Hosea, a lot of people in Judah didn't understand what was being said by Hosea. Hosea was sent to his own people. And a lot of them didn't understand it. But the people in the north had a better chance of it. But here, here you have this guy who starts prophesying, and what's the first thing that he says? Listen to this. Rebu rebuke your mother. Rebuke her, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. That's weird. <laughs> what are you talking about? Imagine a prophet of God coming before the people, and this is the first poem that he speaks, the first oracle that he speaks rebuke your mother, rebuke her, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. But being the wise people that you are, you understand what he's saying, don't you? It has two parts. The first part is it's real for him. He's talking to his children, and he says, I don't know who this person is. She's given herself back to prostitution. She's not my wife anymore. And I'm not her husband. And at the same time, so I think one of the fascinating parts of prophecy is to find the, the double meaning. The second meaning is exactly, Hosea is God's earthly counterpart. Hosea has been set up to live the life that God is living in an earthly fashion. Is your heart broken yet? You feeling the betrayal? It's great, isn't it? Hosea is made to feel what God has felt by Israel. Completely betrayed. This is not my wife. I'm not her husband. Just like he's going to say, you're not my people. And I'm not your God. Do you hear the parallelism? It's important that we hear it. Because here are a group of people who are living however they want to. And God says, I don't even recognize you anymore. 
But that's not the end of the story. So all throughout chapter two, you know, uh, when I coach singing groups, I coach a cappella groups sometimes. One of the important exercises to get people to speak from the heart when they perform, when they sing, because you can sing and you can put words and music together and that becomes a song. But it doesn't mean that people identify with it. It doesn't mean that people will connect to it. And that's where artistry comes in. Artistry is when you know who you're speaking to and then you speak it to them. So you could take a song, I demonstrate this all the time with singing groups, is that you can take a song and you can sing it to different audiences. Imagine singing this song to the love of your life. So it's a love song. Imagine singing this to the love of your life. Now sing it and let me hear that. Imagine they're sitting here and you're singing to them and they sing it and it's one way, it's beautiful, it's fantastic. Imagine singing to that same person, you know, when you're 60 and you've experienced a lot of life. Sing it again. You think they sing it differently? You bet they do. Imagine singing that to your daughter when she's six. Sing it to her. Could you sing the same kind of love song to her? Yeah, but it would be different, wouldn't it? Okay, and then the last one is, imagine singing that same song to your mother before she dies. And you know that she's at the end of her life. Would you sing the same song? And would you sing it differently? Would the words have different meaning? I, I've never stood in front of a group that they haven't cried while they sang the last rendition. Never. It's never happened. They always cry. Because when you sing a love song to somebody who you know you're going to spend the rest of your life with, it's one thing. But when you sing a love song to someone who you're now going to give up, you're speaking in the past tense. Do you see that? It's a very different thing. And that's exactly what's happening here, is that he's, he's speaking, but he's speaking in different ways. And so you could read this poetry in one way to understand that he's speaking to Israel. Or that he's... In another way, speaking to, he's actually speaking to his, his own children and saying, my heart is completely broken. Now, when he speaks to all of Israel about God's relationship to him, is he emotional? Maybe not as much because he's distanced from it. But when he speaks to his children and he says, I don't even know her anymore. Do you think he's emotional then? I do. And that's what God wants him to see. God wants him to see that there is such a thing as having your heart completely rent and broken because of the unfaithfulness of one who has promised to you. And it may sound very weird to our ears to think that God is heartbroken about the unfaithfulness of his people. But it's God chooses the language. God's the one who chose to describe it that way. That when his children are unfaithful to him, it, it just is breaking his heart. It's not a mistake that all of Scripture describes God and his people through the lens of relationship in family, whether it's you know, fathers to children or mothers to children or spousal relationships, God chooses 100% of that language and he tells his prophets, I want you to experience this and know what it's like to have someone who you love and who loved you at one time and no longer does. I just want you to feel that. So he spends <clears throat> all of chapter two with this, there's this sort of love and hate contrast that happens all the way through it where Hosea is so mad at her. And at the same time, but if you came back, I'd love you anyway. Have you ever, I don't, you may not have experienced it, but have you known somebody who's lived through that? That heartbreak? It's heart-wrenching to watch. I can't imagine experiencing it. 
And by the time you get down to the end of the chapter, in this last paragraph on page 761, listen to, this is, now this is Hosea's personal speaking to Gomer and about her through his children. And then it switches and he says, in that day, in other words, the day that you come back to me, but now it's God who's speaking. It says, in that day I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the skies and they will respond to the earth and the earth will respond to the grain, the new wine and the olive oil and they will respond to Jezreel. I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called not my loved one. And I will say to those called not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. So there's this reversal that happens at the end of chapter two. All throughout chapter two, he's been saying, I can't believe you've done this to me. You disgust me. It makes me sick. I'm raising our kids on our own, on my own. And then by the time you get to the end of the chapter, there's this reversal and he says, and at the same time, can you imagine being that torn to say, I hate you. But if you come back to me, I guess I never really hated you to begin with. And if you come back, then I'll take you back. And that's exactly what's being said. So listen, listen to how that enacts itself in Hosea's life. So this is chapter three, verse one. The first three chapters of Hosea are his narrative. Chapters four through 14 are God's narrative. So what you're seeing in these first three chapters is Hosea having to live out <clears throat> the reality of God. Chapter four, you're going to see how it works itself out in God's relationship to his people. So here, chapter three is Hosea. The Lord said to me, go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. So he, we're not told this in the narrative. Chapter two is all this him just throwing his heart out there and saying, I, I can't believe this. But what has happened becomes evident in chapter three. She has run off with another man. And here, the way the Hebrew is constructed here is she hasn't run off with another man. She's run off with a lot of other men. And she continues to come back. And then, so in other words, when she's not out prostituting herself, she's in the safety and shelter of Hosea's home. And that's why he's mad. And then she goes out and she spends time with some other guy. And then she comes back again. And now God says to her, you go find her. And you show her that you love her by buying her back. Because in other words, this last time she has done something where she's indebted to the guy that she's with just like Israel is indebted to Assyria. So, go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. This is just one of those phrases where people are, sacred raisin cakes, what in the world is that? Well, here's the thing is that to, there were certain foods that were put before Raisins were a, a form of energy. They didn't have energy drinks. Raisins were truly something that um, armies would consume before going to battle. It was, it was a food that was reserved for high energy times because they understood. They didn't understand sugar and carbohydrates, but they understood that it gave you a burst of energy. And that's what... and. And they were used for sacred things. Raisins were. Dates were. They were used, they're in a sense, they were used in very sensual um, dinners, marriage dinners. And at the same time, they were also used for the dedication of idols. So there was a sensual way that they were used, and there was an idolatrous way that they were used. And what he's saying is that they... They prefer that relationship. They prefer the relationship with Baal. And he says, they, love a, they turn to other gods 
and love the sacred raisin cakes of these other gods. Now we would not we would think there's better stuff Twinkies. I mean, there's there's other things that are better than that. That's what they had. That's their Twinkie. Okay, I mean, Twinkies are disgusting. But like you know, the orange cakes aren't. Those are delicious. So whatever. Um, or zebra cakes. I don't know. Just cross out raisin cakes and put in whatever it is that is your vice. Um, and so listen to what he says. Hosea says, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver. Does that sound familiar? It shouldn't because it isn't 15, is it? It's 30. All he, so here's the way this is being set up. If you go back to um, Exodus when God sets the price of a slave, when someone is indebted to themselves, there's actually a maximum, there's a price that can be paid. And it's 30 shekels of silver. Does that sound familiar? It should because who else was priced at 30 shekels of silver? Christ, right? So it's the price of a slave. Why does he only give 15? Because that's all he has. Now, he gives the equivalent of the other 15 in stuff. But listen to it. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver, plus about a homer and uh, a lethic of barley. Apparently, that's the other 15 shekels of silver. It's the equivalent of it. And then I told her, this is, this is Hosea speaking to his wife, who has gone off into prostitution. And then I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will behave the same way toward you. And that is the end of Hosea's story. That's it. Does she remain faithful? Does she stay in the house? He's bought her back. You know, to buy her in the first place as his wife. He did. There was a price paid for that, right? And so he already did it once. Now he's doing it again. And he tells her, you need to live here. And you need to be faithful to me, and I will do the same thing to you. And so here's the thing is, who is Hosea acting for? What is he supposed to understand? What, who is he supposed to empathize with? God's relationship with Israel. The, the actual answer to the question is, no, she didn't stay there. He bought her back and it didn't make any difference to her because her heart, what the text has said about two or three times now is that her heart is given to prostitution. She's not coming to stay with him forever. And that's what he says, but she's not going to do it. And if you don't believe that, it's enacted through Israel and the way that Israel reacts to the Lord. And so, Israel, their own redemption happens here at the end of chapter 3. Gomer's restored, Israel's restored, or supposedly. For the Israelites will live many days without king or prince. Remember he said, you're to live with, you're to live with me and be completely dedicated to me. And now Israel is to be completely dedicated to God. But guess what's going to happen? They're actually going to be taken away and they won't have a king or a prince. It says, For the Israelites will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, which were these pillars that they put up to, uh, as a monument to God, the sacred stones, without ephod or household gods, uh, afterward, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. In other words, they were going to be kicked out of the land because they're going to respond like Gomer did. Then what is going to happen is they're going to be actually kicked out of the house. You don't want to come and live with me? You don't want to be faithful to me? Then get out. And God kicks them out of the land. Israel, not Judah, Israel. He kicks them out of the land. They have no kings ruling. The end of the kings happens with a guy named Hosea. That's it. There would be no temple, no temple worship, no sacrifices. They would have nothing. In fact, when they go into captivity, the only thing 
that it seems that they had was copies of the word of God. So when they enter captivity, in both instances, here and in the um, Babylonian captivity of Judah, they enter with only the word of God in hand and small fragments of it at that. No king, no temple, no sacrifices, no land. Do, do, you, do you see what I'm, I'm trying to line up something here? Do you remember when Abraham received the promise in Genesis 12 and Genesis 15? What are the things that he's told that he's going to have? A land, a nation, a, a kingdom, right? A covenant. All these things are spoken to Abraham and then to David as everlasting things. And they're stripped away. And so the people are taken into captivity. So in chapter 4, what happens is and in a a realization of the three children. You have Jezreel in the very first one, when he says, and remember Jezreel means may God sow, or um, scattered by God. And so it says here in the first three verses of chapter four, there's only cursing and lying and murder, stealing and adultery, they break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. That's the word, Jezreel. Bloodshed follows bloodshed. Jezreel follows Jezreel. I mean, you, you are the firstborn. Here it is in the first three verses of chapter four. And you know who he's really, who God is actually mad with? Look, look at on down here in verse four. The NIV is a terrible translation of this verse. Look at any other translation but the NIV. But I'm going to read the NIV just to prove the point. It says, but let no one bring a charge, let no one accuse another, for your people are like those who bring charges against a priest. That's not what it's saying at all. You need to just cross that out. It's saying that you are the priest. He's saying to the priests, you're the problem. It's the leaders of God's people. Do you remember that Peter would talk about all of God's people being a royal priesthood? Here you go. The blame is on the priesthood of God. So the priests, people, they are contrasted by my people. So you remember Lo Ami, the third child, is not my people? Well, the word Ami means my people. And he says, in a couple of different places here. In verse 6, he says, For your people are like those, the priests' people are like those who bring uh, charges against the priests. He says in verse 8, They feed on the sins of my people and relish their wickedness. There's that word again, a me, which means my people. In verse 12, he says, My people consult a wooden idol and a, dinner's, uh, a diviner's rod speaks to them. A spirit of prostitution leads them astray. They are unfaithful to their God. My people. So all throughout this text, he's still calling them my people. My people. And remember, lo ami means not my people. So you have this contrast. He says, you are my people, but you're not my people. And so God is dealing with Israel in the same way that Hosea had to deal with Gomer. I don't even know you, but I still care about you, and I still love you, and I want you to come back. And so God is dealing with this. It's a very distressing way of speaking. And then at the end of this, in verse 15, he says, though you Israel commit adultery, do not let Judah become, adult, become guilty. So now he's been speaking to Israel, and now he's going to start bringing Judah into the picture, just like when we talked about in chapter 1 and verse 7, where Judah is mentioned sort of randomly. This is, we're, we're speaking to Israel. Israel's the one who's, who's shed blood and committed adultery and, and stolen and everything else. And now guess what? He says, Judah, don't you fall into this too. Remember that this is a guy who prophesies for 50, 60 years. And so what begins as him seeing Israel alone doing all of this, by the end of his life, he's starting to see Judah starting to do all the same stuff. He says, Judah, don't, don't you fall into this. Don't you imitate them. And so that's in verse 15. Flip over the page to chapter 5 and verse 5. 
The next time Judah is mentioned, it says, Israel's arrogance testifies against them. The Israelites even... Now, a lot of times in, in Hosea's book, he refers to Israel as Ephraim because Ephraim became the dominant tribe of the northern tribes. So in Hosea's book, he speaks of Ephraim, and sometimes he speaks of Israel, but most of the time he speaks of Ephraim because they are the dominant tribe. And so the dominant tribe goes, everyone goes. And so he's actually speaking of all of Israel. He says, Israel's arrogance testifies against them. The Israelites, even Ephraim, stumble in their sin. And Judah also stumbles with them. Now, we're past the point in chapter 4 and verse 15, he said, don't start to stumble like them. Don't imitate them. Now in chapter 5, verse 5, they're stumbling. We'll go on down in chapter 5 and verse 9 beginning. Ephraim will be laid waste on the day of reckoning. Among the tribes of Israel, I proclaim what is certain. Judah's leaders are like those who move boundary stones. Now, that doesn't, I mean, who cares about boundary stones? Well, it mattered to them because these were perpetually dishonest people. You move a boundary stone a little bit, a few inches every year, and by the time, you know, 10, 20 years, your, your children all of a sudden have more land than they were supposed to have. And God had divided the land among the people the way he wanted it. And so they're moving these, they're, they're setting new boundaries. And it's not just about land, is it? It's about God setting a boundary and then you deciding that the boundary doesn't matter. You can set it where you want. And he says, Judas leaders are like those who move boundary stones. I will pour out my wrath on them like a flood of water. Ephraim is oppressed, trampled in judgment, intent on pursuing idols. I am like a moth to Ephraim, a moth who eats everything. And listen to this statement, like rot to the people of Judah. By the time you get to the end of chapter five, Judah is just as bad as Israel. But Israel's been wrapped up in it for 150 years. There's a, there's a 136 year difference between the time that Israel falls in 722 and the time that Judah falls in 586. They've just had longer in it. But guess what? Judah's right behind them. And Judah's going to have a few good kings left. But eventually, all they're going to have left is bad. And the last kings of Judah, although they're from the house of David, they're evil. And they lead the people into idolatry and adultery. And so in chapter 6 and verses 1 through 3, this is on page 765, it says, come, let us return to the Lord. Now, when the word return is used in Hosea, it's speaking of this relationship. And God is the subject and he is acting on someone else. And what it is saying is repentance. The, re the idea of return is impossible unless you have repented. Do you understand? So listen, here's God stands in a place and his people are around him. And when they begin to walk away, it is impossible for them to return to him until they repent. That's what repentance is, right? It's turning. It's a change, a change of heart. And so people are walking away from the Lord and he says, return. And what he means is repent. Change your mind. Come back to the Lord. And so, come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. Listen to this. If you've never underlined anything in Hosea, underline this one. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. Had you ever seen that before? When Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15 is the chapter where Paul accounts all of the resurrection appearances of Jesus. Let me just read this to you. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but listen to verse 3 and 4. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Do you hear what he said? That he was raised on the third day in accordance with scriptures. When New Testament writers spoke of scripture, what were they speaking of? Old Testament, right? 
Do you know that this is the only reference in all of Scripture to a third day restoration? Paul knew the Scriptures, and he points back to Hosea, chapter 6, and he says, just like the Scripture said, he was going to be raised up on the third day. So just read this again with that in mind. It's the only place in all of Scripture where we're told there's a three-day restoration. After two days, he will revive us. In other words, they have an illness. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us. Isn't that interesting? That we may live in his presence. There's promise in the book of Hosea. It's one of the only places that is just obviously messianic in the book of Hosea. What he's going to spend the next few chapters, chapters 6 through 10, are just a series of accusations and warnings to Israel. And here's the point, is that this isn't the end. So there are two main groupings of accusations and warnings to Israel. And then in chapter 11 and chapter 14 are these two places. So flip over to page 771, and let's visit those really quickly before we're done. In chapter 11, verse 1, there, now God is, after he's given all these warnings and said, this is how you've behaved, now he goes back and he says, when Israel was a child. So here's God speaking as a parent. And listen to these, the perfect memory of a parent. See, I, you know, it's funny because with our three oldest, it was like we experienced those stages in such intensity. And then when we moved on to the next stage, I didn't remember the previous stages, which is kind of pathetic. I don't have a very good memory, but it's also just, it's kind of sad. It's like, you know, the time when the boys were all toddlers. I remember certain incidents from that that were great. It was just, you know, a lot of fun, and it was a lot of work at the same time. But it's like that's gone. And then Zeke comes along, and I get a second chance to experience a toddler. Or, you know, Little League. Zeke's doing Little League baseball right now. It's like, I never thought I'd be back in the Little League field, but here I am experiencing it again. I didn't remember what it was like. Here's God in chapter 11 speaking of how he raised up his child, Israel. Listen to this. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son, which is actually a quote that's used to speak of, scripture, of Jesus. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrifice to the Baals and they burn incense to uh, images. Listen to this. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk. <laughs> Remember when your kid took his first steps? It's like those are big moments, right? I'm the one who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them, I was like one who lifts a little child to the cheek, and I bent down to feed them. So he's, God is speaking like Israel is my little kid. And just as a little toddler, I just remember taking care of them and loving them and caring for them. And yet, they don't care. They don't remember me. They don't have any interest in things that I say. And so Israel's past, then he speaks of Israel's present. Is it just hot in here? Or somebody want to run the temperature back down? Maybe we can get like two minutes of cold before we all pass off. Um, there's two thermostats just running down to 71 is what I had them on. Oh, it's hot up here too. Israel's future is at the end of the chapter. And I just, so here he is, he's speaking of, I remember when you were a little kid and I taught you how to walk and I loved you and I cared for you. And then you didn't care about me. Listen to this in verse eight. This is Hosea 11, verse eight. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboim? Now, these are two cities that you probably don't remember, but these are the two cities that were in the plains where Sodom and Gomorrah were. 
there were five cities that were listed there. Sodom and Gomorrah are two of them, and then these two. He says, how can I give you up? How can I let you go like those places? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I devastate Ephraim again. He's speaking to the future. And he says, I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna do what I said I was gonna do. I told you that I'm gonna, I'm gonna discipline you and I'm gonna hand you over to your enemies, but I'm not gonna do that after all. I mean, this is distress. And then he says, at the end of chapter 11, verse 12, he says, Ephraim has surrounded me with lies and Israel with deceit. He goes back to Israel's name. Jacob's name meant to pluck the heel, remember, to deceive. And he says, oh, no, no wait, that, that was your right name. That is who you are. And he goes on to describe Jacob. Skip over to chapter 14. Did you not get that thing going? Did the air not work? Did you push the down button? No. It just turned the heat on? All right, let's get done. I mean, it's getting so hot in here. We're going to have to talk to David about, like, turning the air on for us or something. Um, okay, so turn over to page 774. Let's wrap up right here. Chapter, this is Hosea 14, verse 1 beginning. He says, return. Remember, that means repent. Repent, Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him. So take words with you means I'm going to give you some words that you need to bring back to God. This is your prayer to God. So here's the prayer. Forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Assyria cannot save us. They were actually paying tithes to Assyria to keep them from hurting them. Assyria cannot save us. We will not mount war horses. We will never again say our gods to what our own hands have made. For you, for in you, the fatherless find compassion. So that's their prayer to God. And what is his response? Well, I will heal their waywardness and love them freely. For my anger is turned away from them. I will be like dew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily, like a cedar of Lebanon. He will send down his roots. His young shoots will grow. His splendor will be like an olive tree. His fragrance like a cedar of Lebanon. People will dwell again in his shade and they will flourish like the grain. They will blossom like the vine. Israel's fame will be like the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim, what more have I to do with idols? I will answer him and care for him. I am a, fl a, a flourishing juniper. Your fruitlessness comes from me. And then the last verse is our wrap up and it's verse nine. Who is wise? Let them realize these things. Who is discerning? Let them understand. The ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. He's saying, you better submit. I, as I was studying Hosea, I kept thinking about how our nation is right now. And it's very discouraging. I know you guys feel it too. It's very frustrating to just watch at how godless we are. And can I tell you the reality is that God's people are not always saved from the godlessness of the nation to which they belong. Do you think that there were people in Israel who were still crying out to the Lord and praying to him? Do you think that there were people in Israel who prayed this prayer that Hosea gives to them to pray? I imagine so. Do you remember Elijah? He stands before God and he says, I'm all that's left. I'm the only one. And God says, no, you aren't. I keep a remnant. I still have thousands who have not bowed the knee to Baal. You can feel like you're all alone in this righteous fight. And the reality is that God always keeps a remnant. And I'll tell you something else. That doesn't mean that we're going to be saved. It doesn't mean that America is going to experience the salvation of God. This may be the end. And I'm not saying that to be negative. I'm just saying that there are faithful people in every aspect of God's history. 
and yet God still judged everyone. So when Israel falls in 722, are some of those people who had the babies torn from the womb, are some of those people righteous people? I'm going to say probably. Apparently they didn't have enough influence over the people around them. Does it mean that we can't pray things back? No. But sometimes we're praying for the wrong things. We need to pray that God's will be done. And not pray for the salvation of our country, for the fix, for the repentance. At the same time, recognize that it is God's sovereign will in all of this. He, through the downfall of Israel, he was illustrating something bigger and more important. And that was that without me, you don't have a chance. And maybe that's exactly the lesson in history that America will be. When people turn away from God, they, don't, they cease to exist. They don't matter. I hope that that's not what happens to us. But I just want you, you, you can't become despondent and have all your hope wrapped up in this. Our hope has to be in something more secure and more eternal. And I'm going to tell you that I think that for the most part, the, the stuff that happened to Hosea, it's recognizable in our society. The idolatry, the adultery, the thieving, the, all of it. The murder. It, it sounds like he's describing us. Not me, not you, but it's us. And I'm just going to say, I think that the lesson for us has to be that we can't put our faith in this, in us. We need to put our faith in the living God. And if he delivers, great. And if he doesn't, as is so often said, you know, the guys who are thrown in the fire, Shadrach, Meshach, and if, if God doesn't rescue us, he is still God. Do you believe that? I think we all need to. We don't take communion because it's our key to getting out of the mess that we're in. It is our key to salvation. It is that whatever happens in this life, whether good or bad, I got another life. And that's why we eat and we drink. Let's take the communion and then we'll get out of this very hot, nasty environment. God, we thank you for the body of Jesus, which is to us a way to escape the punishment of sin. And we're thankful that you have given that to us. Help us to be united as the body of Christ to look for the answers that only you provide. Thank you so much for loving us and sending your son to be punished on our behalf. Through Jesus we pray, amen. God, we thank you for the blood of Jesus, which washes away our sins. Help us to be renewed. Help us to be changed and transformed, to be more like Jesus and less like us. Thank you for all the ways that you save us. And may we be aware of your presence in our lives. Through Jesus we pray. Okay. Anything we need to say before we dismiss this morning? Thanks for putting up with a hot building. Let's remember to talk to somebody and see if we can get the air on, like, you know, the whole time we're here next week. Um, it's quite warm up here. All right, let's dismiss. Um, Eugene, you want to lift it up? Heavenly Father, we thank you for being able to talk to you and to have a good opportunity to learn more about your word and uh, your will for us. We look at now to go out to the home to the safe journey and help us be the examples that we need to be. We thank you, Father. Amen.